so we evolve, and as we evolve, and this is what I learned from the women's movement, and we talked about lessons that you learn from one thing that you take on to the next, is that you're not static. What you did is not finished. Or maybe it was the right thing at the time, and maybe you think later, it needs nuance, it needs changing, I need to be open to challenge. What can you learn from what you've done? The library was my space, and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. Well, hi. It's really nice to see all of you. Um, I have about the quietest voice in the world. So just, if anyone can't hear me, just, just gesture and I'll know what to do. But I'm so excited that you're all here to talk with Maude and me um, on something that really, really feels timely, especially given the IPCC report yesterday. Um, so let's get into it. Hi, Emma. Hi. <laughs> Emma's wonderful. <laughs> I'm blushing already. Um, so this is Maud's book, Still Hopeful. You'll see that there's a lot of sticky notes in this because I marked it up like crazy. Um, I had a lot to think about and a lot to say. And I, and I guess to just dive right into it, I feel like a lot of the time the environmental movement kind of gets a bad rap for being like, negative or... Um, for being kind of doom and gloom. But that's kind of the opposite of what you had going on here. Um, this book is all about keeping the faith and uh, going forward even when it feels hard. And I wondered where you learned that approach. Well, first of all, it's delightful to be here. Thank you all. And I know that we're still coming out or maybe not coming out of this wave, maybe a new wave. And so I appreciate everyone being here. It's one of those, should we or should we not? Um, uh, so thank you. Um, and, you know, I, I worry a lot that, and I've done my fair share of writing terrible things about you know, all the bad stats on this and that and warning people. And, and so I think there's a very important role for facing the facts really, really in, in, you know, in the eye. But at the same time, I worry that a feeling of hopelessness that can come over you when you read things like the latest IPCC report from three days ago and so on, that makes you feel that perhaps the situation's hopeless and then you're paralyzed. And so I've, I, I've felt for a number of years now, I have to talk more about solutions. I have, we all collectively have to talk about what we can do rather than the analysis of what's wrong. But I know because we chatted about this earlier that you also want me to talk a wee bit about the fact that I grew up in a house where we were taught with our oatmeal in the morning um, that if you're lucky enough to live in a place with this kind of opportunity, you have what I call the, a moral imperative to be hopeful, to find the ways that you can make a difference. My father, who's one of my heroes, um, saw five very hard years in the Second World War and came back and said his generation wasn't going to go back to Canada, the Canada that was. They were going to build a social nation state, and he was one of the leaders of the movement against capital and corporal punishment. Um, was at the Don Jail, the last double hanging in 1960 with a picket, you know, with the placard. So I came by it honestly. So I, we really learned this with our, as a child, um, and, and, you know, that you really do have to take action. And you have to get up every day and say to yourself, what can I do? And the, on the best days, we do something good. Um, very often, you know, we're dealing with the realities that are, are very difficult to change, but I think hope is incredibly important. And just to say my definition of hope, which kind of came through near the end of the book, I thought this is clear for me now, is that hope is a commitment to protect all that is <clears throat> good for future generations in the planet. Knowing that you can't uh, control the outcome, but knowing also that there, or having to have faith that there are many, many others who are doing things that you can't even know about and collectively we will make a difference. That makes me feel a lot better, really. <laughs> and there's one moment um, that I think like strikes that chord very strongly, very close to the beginning of the book, one of my favorite sections of your writing. Um, you talk about the moment that you decided to write this after um, a panel discussion in Ottawa in 2019. It's a glorious June day. 
Um, I wondered if you could tell everyone about that night. <clears throat> well, it was an evening in my city, Ottawa, and it was a huge, it's a huge old church, and there were a lot of people, a lot of young people. And a panel of, uh, well, David Suzuki was on it, Avi Lewis, good, good, wonderful people, many, uh, and a number of others. <clears throat> but it was, we were all kind of in a downtime at that point. That, that was when uh, the Trudeau government had just said uh, they were going to buy a pipeline, and the Horgan government was uh, not going to ch uh, challenge fracking and not going to stop the Site C Dam. And we, you know, there was a lot of negativity in the room that night a lot of talk about the sixth grade extinction and so on. And one of my granddaughters, who was 16 at the time, Eleanor, was there with her friends, and they were all kind of sitting like this. And I <clears throat> remember thinking, oh, there's, we've just got to talk about things that people can do. So I talked about work that I was doing at the time, this project called Blue Communities, which is where you get a municipality to make a pledge to protect water as a human right and not allow it to be privatized. And anyway, good things that were, that. I and others were doing. And I had a young woman, I, I, maybe grade 12 student, come up to me at the end in tears and she said, thank you very much for talking about this because I was really feeling, I, I just feel helpless, I don't know what to do. And I walked home and I thought, I've, uh, so I've got to find a way to point, the, to point to the good things that are happening because it's not true that nothing's happening. And if we can stop seeing the glass half empty and start seeing it half full and, and turn, you know, turn our attention to the light, the shadows will fall behind. We have to move forward. Um, and how, how can we do this? I mean, I remember reading, well, every time she speaks about it, Greta Thunberg says when she first found out about cl the climate crisis, she went into a deep depression. She stayed home for two years. She was only 11 and she lost 20 pounds on that little frame of hers. And one day she got up and she said, that's it, <clears throat> that's despair gone, I've got to do something, and sat, as we all know now, in, in, uh, in front of the parliament buildings in Stockholm for several years and started a youth movement. And she said the moment she took action, the despair lifted. And, and so this notion that we, have to, we, we don't know where hope is going to come from, we don't know where success is going to come from. I quote um, Rebecca Solnit in, from her book, uh, Hope in the Dark, and she says, Progress isn't uh, an army moving, marching forward. It's a crab scuttling sideways, you know, or, or centuries of water dripping on a stone and changing the shape of a stone. And, and we just have to have faith that change will happen in ways that we maybe can't control and we've got to stop thinking we can. But that um, the reason for hope is, 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 is what gets us up in the morning. And is that kind of why you structured the book the way you did as as part memoir and part advice manual for, for activists? Um, does that guide your approach? Yeah, the first chapter, as you know, Emma, because you've read the book, um, is about hope and the concept of what um, uh, Joan Halifax, a wonderful American spiritual environmentalist and human rights activist, calls wise hope. <clears throat> she talks about the need to, to understand the difference between false hope and wise hope. Wise hope being that you look the issue in the eye, you don't pretend it's not there, but you, but you commit to doing something. And she should know she works with men on death row. Like if anybody finds hope in a difficult situation, and she says people die, civilizations die, stars die, but that doesn't mean you don't work towards um, change. Um, <clears throat> and so the first chapter is just looking at that concept and, and how we can define hope and how we can allow grief but not despair, and I make a big distinction between them, how we can learn from the past. I go into the Second World War and the lessons we learned coming out of it, which, I mean, there's such a horrific time, um, uh, but the first uh, real um, human rights framework um, internationally was established, the creation of the UN, the creation of the, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and so on. So looking at what can come out of, at the time I was thinking of the pandemic, not the horrible war in Ukraine because it wasn't, it wasn't happening when I was writing, <clears throat> but what can we learn and how can we do that? And then the next three chapters are different parts of my career, the women's movement, the fight against economic globalization and bad free trade agreements and the fight for water justice. And what I learned, what I, is there something that I can help people with, young people particularly, or people who are tired and kind of burned out, what can I share that I've learned? And then the last chapter is just good stuff. 
And I made myself do good stuff. I would start to say, well, here are the problems. And I'd say, nope, you get two paragraphs to say the problem. <laughs> and that's all you get. You, got, you stop there. You got to move to the... You got to move to the things that are happening, and there is just an amazing amount of fabulous work being done. Um, and, uh, and I don't believe we've ever been more ready as a human family to deal with climate, the climate crisis, for instance. So, it, yeah. So I structured the book to be part memoir only, so that I could share what I learned. That's why it's called Lessons from a, a Lifetime of Activism. And I, I, I think of, I look at it sometimes, and I think I wish somebody told me some of those things way back then. But anyway, yeah, I think when we talked yesterday, um, I mentioned that I felt like a lot of these things should be like printed on a poster um, and hung up somewhere because they just make sense. I was like, why aren't we all doing that? Um, but one thing I really loved about this book, um, one thing that made it a much happier read than it could have been, was the way that you wove in the need to, to recognize small joys and beautiful moments. That night that you decided to write this book, you, you write that the evening was too lovely to feel anything but joy. And you talk about apple blossoms and the scent in the air, um, that kind of spring, summer night we're all kind of craving right now. Um, at other points, you talk about the way it feels to be met by strangers with open arms or um, the way that a, a beer after a long day like really just hits the spot. Um, how do you maintain the ability to see those moments and to feel those moments uh, even when things are quite bleak? Well, the human interaction, the building of a movement is incredibly important. As you know, Emma, one of the themes of the book and my advice is, is taking the long view. So if you think, well, I failed at that, I, you know, we had this goal and, and we, we didn't get it, I'm just going to go home, I'm never going to try again, which happens. Um, then, okay, that's fine, nobody's judging you, but if you really want to make deep social and cultural change, you take the long view. You're not in this just for this one issue, you're in to make a change in, in, in society. Um, and, and that means you have to step back when you're exhausted or when you know you're getting burnt out. It means being kind to other people, giving credit in the movement to others and the work that they're doing. It means building on those personal relationships. I, I've Many a time I've got off a plane in some country. I've never met the people who meet me at the airport, but there <clears throat> we share a set of values. I know immediately, because we've done work together, you know, at long distance, and I know that we share a worldview, and they're like family. And, and this really stood us in good stead through the through the last two years of, of climate, the climate or the, of the um, pandemic, because we couldn't meet in person very much. And so just the trust that gets built when you spend long hours working together, building something, making presentations, going on a march, um, doing the hard work of, of social change. Um, and as I say, at the end of the, it wasn't the beer by itself, it was the beer with people. <laughs> of course, um, yes. Uh, although the beer by itself is fine too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's building, no, it's, 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 it's it's t it's taking it's it's like a good a, a, a good athlete learns to do, it's, you know, pace yourself, because if you do it right, you're in it for the long run. That makes sense, especially because a lot of the movements, or I guess there's three, but the movements you talk about in this book, some of them span like my entire lifetime, right? And um, keeping that up is is a feat. Um, and speaking of my lifetime, I feel like. It, in a lot of ways, I'm kind of your target demographic with this book. Um, full transparency, I'm 26. I don't remember a lot of the events that happened. Um, and I'm sometimes I feel too young to even comprehend the enormity of, of what happened just before my birth. Um, for example, the ways that second wave feminism really upended the world um, and society. And of course, I know about them. but. Um, I don't know if I'd internalized it. And when we talked beforehand, you mentioned that you felt like you had one foot in one world, the world that you were born into, and then one foot in the other, this new world that, that was ushered in. Tell me about what that was like. Well, it's a wonderful example of, of the change that can happen uh, in, say, 100 years for women. The few years before my mother was born, the Canada, well, it wasn't the Canada Elections Act, it was the Empire Elections Act, said no woman, idiot, lunatic, or child shall vote. 
Um, and, you know, and it was only a couple of years later that my mother was born. <clears throat> and within, you know, a hundred years, there's just been phenomenal change. When I was growing up in Ottawa in the 1950s, my mother couldn't get a driver's license. She couldn't open a bank account. She couldn't get a travel visa without my, my father's uh, signature and approval, right? Now he was a wonderful man, so that wasn't a problem. But it was, you know, if, uh, if a man... Uh, hit his wife or beat his wife, the police would come and walk him around the block and tell him to cool off. I mean, it, this was just a very different time. Um, and so I, what, I, what I think is important, because I'm not dead yet, like I'm not so old, that <laughs> my generation isn't close. so old that, uh, that it isn't relevant. It happened in a, actually in a fairly short period of time. We were just in a movement whose time had come and we were feeling our oats like we knew nothing was going to stop us and it was absolutely an amazing and heady time so yes one foot in the in the world where I was to be <clears throat> you know um, get married and have kids and do all that stuff and put your husband first and then just being in this vanguard of, of this movement and I remember it came to me very um, sudden and very clearly one day when I was uh, criticized in the Globe and Mail. I can't remember what it was now, but I was feeling sorry for myself and I was sulking around. I said to my mother, you know, and she said, cut it out. She said, serious people have serious enemies. She said, if you're going to take positions, you're going to, you're, you know, you're going, people are going to react to you and this is, this is the path you've chosen. That was extremely, I, I, where'd you learn that? <laughs> That's another one so for the poster. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think the other thing, Emma, when I look at people your age, activists your age, and that, and you're right, although I don't write, I didn't write it only for young people, but I had that in mind, is that I think the whole fight against the concept of economic globalization and free trade uh, was one that your generation in many ways um, doesn't know about. And I, I really hope people will read that part of it and, and internalize. The, 19, the reaction to the Second World War was the creation of social programs, social security, um, the, the so-called welfare state, uh, the, the, the growth of a, of a whole concept. But of course, there was a backlash against that. And that backlash manifested itself as economic globalization. Uh, governments have gotten too big, or as one famous uh, comment was made at a trilateral commission that democracy, there was an excess of democracy. Um, and so we had to move. We had to move back. And so, and this is at the time that corporations, some corporations, were going uh, transnational, not even multinational, but literally over and above the countries in which they were uh, founded. Um, and they so they would have their production in these countries, their manufacturing there, and their tax havens here, and their head office in a different place. And they didn't have any loyalty to the country of their origin anymore and they wanted rules for them and they wanted the lowest set of common rules so that they could go across those borders without bumping into higher standards and so deregulation of environmental and health and, and worker rule uh, uh, workers rights rules um, privatization of energy, of healthcare, of education, of water. These were all the hallmarks, but the biggest tool they had were free trade agreements that basically constrained what governments could do. And I write in the book about the first one, the first of the modern uh, agreements, which was the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement when Brian Mulroney was prime minister in Canada and uh, Reagan was uh, president in the United States and we didn't want Reagan ruling us, right? And we were very, I was very worried at that time about social programs and what would happen to, to equality issues and so on. Um, but I, we fought it. We lost that one. We lost NAFTA. Not that we lost the popular opinion. It was just all politics. But we went on to win a number of very important fights. But the whole concept of economic globalization has not been truly um, uh, uh, confronted since then as it's becoming to be uh, confronted now because of COVID. So I think it's really important for people your age because it's kind of like a fish doesn't see the water. You were born, this was already done. NAFTA, everybody thinks NAFTA's terrific, all the newspapers, nobody talks about it anymore. I can show you how NAFTA transformed in, in the, and the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and the WTO transformed our societies and made us unprepared for the for the COVID uh, pandemic that came, and the and the glaring inequality that that the pandemic demonstrated to us all, and we all are saying we told you so, 
I mean, even before the pandemic, the, glo the, the UN was saying that three quarters of the world's working age population is in the precariat, doesn't have proper jobs, doesn't have, they don't have, um, you know, security, they don't have pensions, they don't have uh, uh, proper pay, uh, three quarters, and that's not in, just in the global south, that's a phenomenon we're seeing here as well. So this great experiment failed, and it's very important, I think, for us to understand what the roots were. And when you get even the, the, um, <clears throat> the International Monetary Fund now <clears throat> saying that COVID proved that the private sector couldn't meet this challenge, calling for governments to get back in the game, saying that we need massive government spending on health care and, and human rights and uh, care for people, <clears throat> this is the exact opposite of what the IMF has been saying for 30, 40 years. <clears throat> so uh, I, I just, I feel that that piece of history is really important because if we don't write our history, um, it gets lost. And this was a very big part of the collective movement of our <clears throat> workers and environmentalists and the women's movement, all of us together, um, uh, took on in the, in the um, 80s, particularly the 80s and the 90s. And I think we've been proven to be very right. That's an interesting point, because what really, like that particular movement that you wrote about made me wonder how you measure <clears throat> victory with a, a fight that goes on for so long. I mean, the, the agreements were signed. Um, the Battle of Seattle happened, and not much changed right away. Um, you know, some of the opinions that you were talking about decades ago have become things that are in the New York Times now. You know, they're acceptable mainstream opinions, um, things people talk about. But it strikes me that maybe it wasn't always easy to see that. How did you keep going? And <clears throat> well, the women's movement was very different. We were, we were on a roll, and we were in the right place at the right time. And, and basically, I think the goddess was with us, right? Whereas fighting economic globalization, when it was at its prime, when it was like popular and, and all the world leaders were, were promoting it and the World Bank was promoting it and the, and the creation of the W to the World Trade Organization, it, this was a harder fight. Um, and it really meant that we had to come together. But we did have huge, <clears throat> huge successes. We lost the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement because uh, there were three parties, the NDP and the Liberals were both against the agreement. They split the vote. They, we absolutely had the popular vote, and so we got it. And then NAFTA, Jean Chrétien promised he would not adopt NAFTA. He would have six fundamental changes, or he would not adopt it. And he didn't, he lied. <laughs> it was one of the very first things he ever did when he took power was sign NAFTA. Uh, without those changes, but we did then work with people in Latin America to stop the extension of NAFTA to the free trade area of the Americas. And the most powerful one that we, that we fought was something called the Multilateral Agreement on Investment, which was a proposed agreement through the OECD, the uh, Economic uh, uh, Cooperation, uh, the group of, I think it's like 65 of the, the biggest um, uh, uh, countries at the time. Um, and they re basically wanted the WTO to take on this project, but the, the countries of the Global South were opposed, and this was going to give corporations of all of the countries the same rights to sue as they got under the Nath North American Free Trade Agreement in North America. And we led a fight. It was Canadians who led it. I wrote two books on it, went over to Paris to the OECD meetings, and we confronted them, and we had great big demonstrations, and we, we, we won. And I remember when we won the <clears throat> front page of the Globe and Mail, they said, the, you know, nobody understood, like, who are these people? It's like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Where did they come from, right? And we went on from there to the battle in Seattle where we shut down the WTO. And it was so powerful and we were so successful. I mean, I remember when, when Bill Clinton phoned Al Gore because Al Gore was there to put the icing on the cake. It was so wonderful and we shut it down. He said shut it down. Um, and then the 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 uh, <clears throat> the, um, the Rand Corporation was was hired uh, by the American government to figure out who are these people, and they said we were like mosquitoes. 
that we were everywhere. They couldn't find a headquarter. Nobody was sort of in charge, but we stung, and we, they just didn't know what to do with us. That was the, I mean, that was the Rand Corporation explaining who this movement was. It was, these were heady times, I have to tell you. We chased the WTO from one place to another, uh, to Cancun. I went to um, um, uh, Qatar, went just after 9-11, so just the security was unbelievable. Uh, it, you know, we just, we, Hong Kong, we were, we just chased them around the, the world and the WTO is on its knees. I've got a great quote in there. Uh, a, a woman a, a economist in, in, in the U.S. says, the WTO is like that old guy at the bar. He's got a nice suit on, but it's sort of old and pretty seedy and he's looking around and thinking, what happened? Everything passed me by, you know. So, <clears throat> it's, but it's important to know, Emma, because we had successes and that's the point that I'm trying to make in the book and we need to take that lesson to the climate crisis. You don't know where the wind is going to come from. Do you, do you think I thought that we could stop the OECD uh, the, the most powerful corporations and, 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 and countries in the world from adopting something that was 90% done. We got freedom of information request into the Canadian government around the multilateral agreement on investment, and we were told there's no such thing. You all, and the, 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 the uh, <clears throat> trade minister at the time said, oh, Maude, you and your conspiracy theories. And I thought, yeah, well, when I hear that, I think about the cow uh, in, in, on the field and, and so reading and the other cow says, you and your conspiracy theories and yet this one says, yeah, but this says where our beef really comes from, you know, it's like, I just remember this. <laughs> Very clearly thinking, you're lying, I know you're lying. And so we received in a brown paper bag, literally a couple of weeks later, the almost completed document the Canadian government had been dealing for three years with the business community in this country. They were all set to go, and we stopped them. And we could do this, and this is, the, this is what has to be passed on to new generations, is that just take a deep breath. You're gonna walk, as Gandhi says, you've gotta walk the path that you, you, you know, don't assume that path is already there for you. You may have to, to, to you know, create that path yourself, but it's, you just don't know when you're going to win. And we, we could have walked away and said, well, we did our best with NAFTA. And we said, no, not. And just one last thing, and I know you've got a million questions, but the issue of she does me well. ISDS, the Institute for uh, our, um, uh, um, Investments uh, Dispute Settlement, uh, which is the ability which first was introduced in NAFTA for corporations to sue governments of another country. We've got it on the run. It's not in the new... North American trade agreement, it was taken out. The, Canada is negotiating a trade, trade agreement with Great Britain, there's no ISDS in it. There's no ISDS and the biggest trade agreement in the world um, is one now, the Pacific uh, Rim. Um, and they were gonna have an ISDS in it, it's been taken out. The Europeans have said they will never sign another agreement with investor state rights. This is a huge win and nobody knows about it. I just like, wanna I just want to sort of yell, go out in the street and yell. My husband doesn't let me do that because I yelled at the truckers in Ottawa a lot. And I did the thing a lot. And so my, my Andrew said to my grandkids, we were out today, I went together when I watch your grandmother, don't let her out of your sight. <laughs> She's going to get beaten up by a trucker, by a mother trucker. But it's important that we know this because if we don't, if we don't know about it, if we don't write about it, if we don't write what happened and how much fun it was, it was so much fun to shut down the WTO in Seattle. I got my hair done right in the middle of it. I, 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 I was out, I was tear gassed, I was, you know, exhausted, but I needed a haircut. So I stopped, got my hair done, just a cut. And there were all the protesters going by, and I said, all oh, those protesters, you know, and as soon as I got my hair fixed, I went out and joined them. You have to just have some joy with this and know when to be soft on yourself and others. I love this. I love all of this. <laughs> Maud is trying to butter me up here. She knows I'm from Seattle. And so battle from Seattle or battle of Seattle details? Yes. Um, <laughs> But I, I think um, one thing that really struck me about that was that wisdom that you never really know 
what little thing you do now can, can lead to a victory later. I come at it differently in, in journalism as opposed to activism, but this happens all the time. Like I write about uh, some one-off local event, right? Um, in the last couple of years, there was this one thing about a, a wetland and pickering and um, some developers wanted to build a, an Amazon warehouse on it. And you know, I wrote it up and I was like, oh, looks like that wetland's out the door. And it turned into a huge fight. It became this huge microcosm of of um, questions about like Ontario's future and development and nature and climate. Um, and so, yeah, it was really nice to see that reflected, I guess, especially- and Emma is a brilliant journalist with the Narwhal. So just everybody should be following her and the Narwhal because it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, institution of journalism in our country. Again, she's buttering me up, um, <laughs> but I'll take it. Um, and so, I guess this book, one thing you might notice reading it is that it's very current. I think it might be the most like current book I've ever read. And I, I got the inside scoop on, um, on how you did this. <laughs> you, you tortured your publishers. Um, could you tell us about when you finished it and, and why it feels so recent? Well, <clears throat> wonderful Susan Renouf is in the audience somewhere. Um, my editor, and um, <clears throat> Susan and I worked, uh, well, we did the first l level of it, and then others do other levels of, of final preparation. And But I wanted to get the, the COP26 in there, and COP26 was the end of November, and here we are with the book out now. now any publisher will tell you that's a very short period of time. I was like, I please, 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 I have to get, and then could we take this out? Oh, I found another quote about, uh, you know, inclusion or whatever. Can we put that in? And I was just, ha we were having this back and forth. It was, they were wonderful. ECW Press, all power to them. Uh, yes. <clears throat> ECW Press just just stayed with me as long as I could, but I said I can't have a book coming out at this point um, without dealing with COP26 and what happened there, and and also all the work that's being done on um, <clears throat> biodiversity, uh, uh, the the uh, protection and restoration. It's just I mean it's just so much happening, and it's work on plastics, an international plastics agreement, an international agreement on uh, against uh, deep sea mining. Uh, uh, you know, um, if there's just uh, the agreement on methane that, that came out of COP26. We need to say there was there nowhere near what it needed to be done, but we, we know the complications, but it went further than any, any has gone so far, and, uh, and uh, I just felt it had to be said. Um, yeah, so thank you to ECW Press for being so kind to me, letting me keep it current. Okay. Right up to, I'd say right up to mid-December, <laughs> there's stuff in there. It's got me sweating. <laughs> and, and so you finished this until late December. Um, one of the other things that was really current in it was your reflections on COVID. Um, we're slightly further into that now, somehow, than we were. Um, and I wondered how you're feeling about those reflections now. Well, I mean, we've all lived through this for the last two and a bit years now. <clears throat> I think I said a few minutes ago, and I think it bears repeating that what COVID, one of the things COVID had done, has done is just shone a spotlight on the incredible um, disparities and in inequity in our world. Um, the fact that we don't have vaccines appropriate numbers of vaccines in the global south. A number of us have been working to get the WTO to uh, waive the patent protection for the, for the vaccine companies because they could transfer that technology and we could be saving lives, lives tomorrow. The technology, there are companies in the global south ready to take that technology, but they're protected. And Canada is one of the countries that won't give in on that because we just protect, we, because we're just Free Trade Boy Scouts, Pierre, uh, Pierre. Uh, Justin Trudeau has never seen a free trade agreement he doesn't love, and it's just a criticism that I, I don't understand because I think he does other things better, but not that. So um, so I think it, that's been, and, and then the, the incredible amount of money some people have made, and the, the, the you know, the, 
the, and, and on water, well, one of the first things that we were told was wash your hands with soap and warm, warm water. Well, it turns out that over half the population of the planet doesn't have a place to wash their hands with soap and warm water. Can you believe that? There are countries, there are communities, many, many of them in the global south, um, and even in the global north, where there's no running water in the health clinic. There's no running water in the schools. There's no, there's no place to wash your hands with, 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 with soap and warm water. <clears throat> now, one of the things that might be a silver lining here is that we have shone the light on, on these deep inequities, and there is a lot of talk, even at the WTO, and the new head of the WTO is an African woman who is, has actually said one of her um, goals is vaccine equality, which is a, it not radical, but for the WTO, quite radical. Um, but the, the, I, I, don't have, uh, I have not seen a, a study that puts it all together, but I have a number of reports that I've collected that I'm pretty sure show that we have been putting uh, serious funding into sanitation services in the global south because of COVID. So COVID um, shone the light on the need to do this. And you know, I've, people will know if they know my work that uh, the, the fight for water justice has been a huge one. Since we got the United Nations <clears throat> to recognize the human right to water and sanitation, four dozen countries have either amended their constitution or brought in a new law to recognize the human right to water. We have a number of really exciting court cases where the human right to water, the resolution has been used to give real rights to, to people. So when I say you don't know where it's, you know, take a chance. We took a chance putting that um, resolution to the United Nations. I thought we were going to lose. Canada, under Stephen Harper at the time, was absolutely opposed to the human right to water and led the fight against it at the UN. I was mortally, morti mortally <laughs> mortified. But so was the U.S. opposed, so was Great Britain, and so on. So was the World Bank, so was the WTO, and so on. And, and all the big water corporations and all the big food corporations, they all wanted water as a private uh, commodity. And we just had the guts to put it to the U.N. And lo and behold, <clears throat> 141 countries voted in favor, and only 42 did not. And they didn't have the guts, including Canada, to vote against. They abstained. Um, but it's really important. We just did it. Just put put the question and see where we go. And what's what's unraveled from it since then is that there's been a sea change in how we view the concept. It, there was, you know, the the concept before was the the people who are poor don't have access to water. It's a, it's an issue of charity. It, it's a need they have, and it can be uh, uh, dealt with by charity or government handouts or whatever. No, we say no, it's an issue of justice, fundamental human rights. And we're now beginning to really see a lot of the environmental work that we're doing through the lens of human rights. It's a wonderful man named David Boyd, and I write about him in the book. Um, <clears throat> he's a Canadian, he's an, uh, a lawyer from BC, and he's the UN Special Rapporteur on uh, human rights and the environment. And he's working to get the UN to recognize uh, the right to a health, the human right to a healthy environment, and again, you just have to stay with it. And but David put such a powerful argument ab about how if we can uh, bolster environmental agreements that we make through a human rights lens, how much more powerful it is. How because frankly, human rights um, traditions are much more deeply entrenched in our governments, in our in our constitutions, and so on. So. It's just the thinking continues to evolve. I write about um, the rights of nature, which is a, a really exciting concept. And we're seeing some very exciting work being done here in Canada, um, an indigenous uh, community up in the Magpie River in northern uh, Quebec has declared its river to be a legal person. And they are the caretakers. There's a whole coalition working on um, the St. Lawrence River. Um, so we evolve, and as we evolve, and this is what I learned from the women's movement, and we talked about lessons that you learn from one thing that you take on to the next, is that you're not static. What you did is not finished. Well, maybe it was the right thing at the time, and maybe you think later, it needs nuance, it needs changing, I need to be open to challenge. What can you learn from what you've done um, to move into areas that are new? And there's just so much exciting work being done, and I want young people to think, I can do something. I can get up in the morning and do something. It might not be everything, but as you know, I'm not gonna let it 
I'm not going to let it overwhelm me. I'm going to take the piece of it that I can, and I'm going to reach out with my hand and touch the web of the universe where I exist. Maybe I can't fix the whole thing, and you certainly can't, because if you think you can, you're thinking too much of yourself, right? But, but put your hand out and touch, touch what you can and make the difference where you are. And, um, and have, you have to have faith that you don't even know who else is doing what other incredible work. But you can't be and you aren't alone in caring. Speaking of that faith, um, on environmentalism, you write that you believe people are ready to embrace a new relationship with Earth, one that, um, that works out a lot better for us than uh, the last couple centuries have. And um, you write about all the ways in which nature is healing. Um, the ozone layer, for example, when I was a kid, that was a big, huge, scary issue. And you note that actually, thanks to changes we made, that should be all fixed up by uh, the middle of this century. Um, but some people still feel like it's not fast enough. Um, how do you maintain hope right now, especially well, when things feel yeah, dark? It's hard. And we, you and I talked about the newest IPCC report, which just came out a couple of days ago. <clears throat> and it's devastating, although there is some good stuff in it. Here's me being the positive person again. They actually uh, say if, if you look at countries and commitments made by some countries, they're working. And I have a number of... Uh, studies in the book as well that show very clearly that um, when commitments are made, we can make a difference. It's just that they're not, there aren't enough of them. There are countries that aren't doing any of that um, and communities that aren't doing any of that. And so it, it all doesn't balance out. And so, yes, we have to do more. We have to do better. The IPCC is now saying we've got three years to really stop that uh, growth in, in greenhouse gas emissions. But what is, what is exciting me and what I write about, I call it the age of nature, which is that I call it a, a tsunami of interest in the concept of biodiversity restoration and understanding that while we are fighting to, to limit and, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and it's terribly important and nobody's saying that that, that shouldn't stop, but we all know that's not going to stop tomorrow. We, we, we have to find other ways of, of capturing that carbon, of restoring nature. And, and the concept of biodiversity restoration is basically that we have to protect and restore watersheds, wetlands, soil, and forests. And we have to rebuild where we don't have them. The Canada has pledged two billion trees that we're going to, are going to be planted. The project has already started. We've, we're one of the countries that have agreed to what's called 30 by 30 by 2030, that 30% of our land will be protected uh, in, by, uh, as a biodiverse um, uh, designated uh, area, which doesn't mean people don't live there. And we need to be very careful that we're not talking about the clearing of people from, from areas, because that's happening in some countries in the global south. But the, there is commitment. There is an understanding, I think, that we have put ourselves over nature, dominion over nature, that water re is a resource to, to um, to serve us, you know, to, for profit and, and, and convenience. Um, and no, you know, water is essential for life. And I think we're really beginning deeply to understand the indigenous teachings about the, our being part of nature, that if we hurt nature, we hurt ourselves. When we heal nature, we're healing ourselves, that we are not above, we are part of. And I, I find, and again, positive, uh, incidents, positive polls that show Canadians just on this particular issue are deeply committed to reconciliation in a way that I have never seen in all my years of activism in this country. I really believe there's been a sea change and I think it's related to the understanding that we have to reestablish our, our relationship with nature. How we do that? Millions of ways and I talk about the donut economy if we if you got a minute but um, it's very important that we look towards the, the, the good things that are happening and the leadership that's, that's out there. And it just gives me great hope. I look at young people, I look at indigenous youth leaders, and I'm just blown away. I think, whew, you know, they're just, they're leading the way and they know, they know the, the, the values upon which we have to build. I, I just find it very hopeful.